Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 1 through 3. Carnality. Evidence of carnality, personal sin. Personal sin could be in at least three categories. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. These should be and must be confessed to regain spirituality, the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, to make the Word of God effective in learning and living. I give you a moment to do that through your priesthood, responsibility. Our Father, encourage our hearts today about the subject of one Lord. Boy, it will separate. It will separate the churches in Christianity. It will separate the churches of Christianity from the rest of the world of religion. This one doctrine will cause people to pick up stones in order to destroy Christianity. How dare they say that a man could be deity? And we'll show them why today in this study, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with Thomas. This is quite a revelation to this apostle, teacher, disciple. Following the resurrection of Christ, if you'll open your Bibles to the 20th chapter of John. Thomas said it all, and he said it really clear, having brought to the real realization that Jesus Christ was in fact a deity of God. Jesus Christ was the deity of God. Became quite a revelation to that disciple after the resurrection. When we pick up this story in John 20, we pick up this story in verse 24, eight days after the resurrection of Christ, when you read John 20, we are now eight days. We're at the second Sunday after the resurrection of Christ, the actual resurrection of Christ, in which the disciples, with the exception of Thomas, who was not with them, had a meeting with the resurrected, what we call a post-resurrection appearance of Christ, had already met with him came back excitingly telling the others, a disciple, Thomas, who was not with them present at that time, the 11 disciples, about it. And he said, that's nuts. Well, kind of, he said it kind of that way. He said, I don't believe it. Well, we pick the story up in verse 24. Thomas, one of the 12... That's a general name, only 11, because Judas killed himself. We now are down to 11. Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came earlier a week ago, if you read chapter 20. The other disciples, therefore, were saying to him, they were excitedly saying to him, we've seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. What did they call him? Listen, what did they call him? The Lord. They called him the Lord. He said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my fingers into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side where the spear went, I will not believe. How crazy is that? Jesus himself had taught his 12 disciples over and over and over and over again the last year that he was going to Jerusalem. He was going to be charged with a national crime. They were going to put him, they were going to, put him to death by crucifixion. Three days later, he would be raised from the dead. He told them all that. And he pounded it like crazy in the book of Matthew. 
When you start with the 16th chapter of Matthew, he pounds that idea all the way to the end. The resurrection has come, and now he's pounding it again. How is it possible that you don't believe I've been raised from the dead? Eleven, uh, ten of the uh, original eleven, Judas dead now of the twelve, ten of them have seen him and said they've seen him, and he's not believing them. And he says, unless I see him with my own eyes, I will not believe with my own heart. That's not, how, that's not how the Christian faith works. If you're the person that thinks that you have to see it before you believe it, that's worldly thinking. That's not the belief system. That's not how the divine system works. That's not how God's system works. God's system works by faith. You walk by faith, not by what? Sight. Not by sight. You walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Thomas said, I will not walk unless I see it. I will not walk by faith unless I see it. A lot of believers think that way. That's wrong. That's not how you live the Christian life. You walk by faith, not by sight. Thomas said, I walk by sight, not by faith. And that's why he's in a mess. And so Jesus is going to say to Thomas, watch this. Here's what he's going to do with Thomas. After eight days again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came to the door, having been shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace be with you. He had to always say that. Why? The guy steps. Listen, the doors are locked. The windows are locked, and he steps into the room. We'd all get nervous. Then he said to Thomas, reach here your finger. Here's what we would say. Thomas, give me your finger. See my hands? Reach here your hand and put it in my side and be not unbelieving or stop unbelieving, disbelieving, and start believing. Be not unbelieving, but believing. Listen to Thomas. My Lord and my God. What did he just call Jesus? My Lord and my God. Because that's absolutely right. Jesus Christ is one Lord. And that one Lord is deity. He was deity in the flesh. Before he went to the cross, it's called hypostatic union. Undiminished deity and true humanity in one unique person of the universe by virgin birth. Impeccable to go to the cross and there die for our sins. That's who he was. God raised him from the dead, put him in a resurrection body, and he is the Lord. He was the Lord before he went to the cross. He's the Lord after he went to the cross. He was the Lord in his humanity before the cross. He is the Lord after the cross in his humanity of resurrection body. When Thomas says, my Lord and my God, he's finally got it. And Jesus gave him a piece of good advice because he has a problem with it. What was Jesus' piece of advice that Thomas has a problem with? Stop unbelieving. Stop walking by sight. And start walking by faith. You have a real problem with that, Thomas. It needs to be corrected. 
Listen to what he says. To Thomas's response, my God, my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Is that what you're basing your faith on, Thomas? Are you basing what you just said to me? Are you basing what you just said to me based on that you saw me or that you believe me? Thomas, you must be sure because this is a problem you have and it's got to be corrected today. Not tomorrow, not a week from now. We're not going to slow walk this thing in your walk, in your life. You people slow walk this stuff and you should fast walk it. We're going to move from that. that that's a hindrance in the, in the Christian life. It's a hindrance. You don't walk by, listen, you walk by faith, not by sight. Did you notice that he put a question on him? Thomas, I hear what you're saying. I want to get clarity on it. Because it appears to me that you, you now are believing me because you've seen me. What I'm asking you, Thomas, is do you believe? Is this part of your faith system? Now watch what he says. Watch what he says to him. See, we miss that question. See, you miss the question in verse 29. Now listen to what he says. Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. What are they believing? They're believing the word of God. They don't have, it's not rationalism, it's not empiricism, it's faith. The Christian life is not lived by empiricistic ideas or sight or rationalism, logic. The resurrection makes no sense. There's no logic that he comes back in a resurrection body. How could you ever put that in the test tube and come out with some kind of scientific theory? It comes by faith. Faith in the word of God. Did I not tell you I would be raised from the dead? Yes. Am I raised from the dead? Yes. What's your faith based on? The promise that you would be raised from the dead. It has not changed. Three days after my burial, I will be raised from the dead. Are you believing that, Thomas, or are you believing because you saw me? Are you believing the word that said I would be raised on the third day? I was raised on the third day. Your faith should be in that. Faith is in the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Thomas makes this great declaration. He said, Thomas, is this emotionalism? Is this logic? Is this empiricism? Or is this faith? Right? He put a question to him. He's asking him that. And then he makes this wonderful, bold statement about the Christian life is lived by faith, not by sight. It's not by human logic or empiricism. You don't have to see it. You don't have to put it in a test tube. But you do have to have the word of God. And so Thomas makes this wonderful declaration that my Lord is my God. My Lord and my God are one. Are you saying to me, Thomas, that I am deity in flesh in a resurrection body? And are you saying that based on faith in the word of God? If we're saying that, then this is going to be a blessed day for you. In Colossians 1.15, we are told that Jesus Christ, now listen to me, 
Colossians 1.15, Jesus Christ is the visible manifestation of an invisible God. Yeah, you know that? You can't put that in the test tube. There's no logic in that. Romans, the fourth, uh, John, the fourth chapter, God is a spirit. Those who worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. Do you realize in the Godhead, two of them are spirit and one is manifestation of both of them? God is a spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit, obviously. The only member of the Godhead that is the visible manifestation of God is Jesus Christ. He was in the flesh, and he's in the post-resurrection flesh. Resurrection body. Can't put that in the test tube. If you've got to put it in the test tube, then you're an unbeliever. By that, I mean you don't believe. You're like Thomas. And you're not going to move any further in your Christian life until you get this settled. This lesson is to bring that some kind of settlement to your life. Do you believe this or not believe it? If you don't believe it, then you're stalled. Your car is out of gas. You're on the side of the road. You won't pick that. Yes, and your car is not going to go until it gets gas, and it's not going to get gas until you resolve it. That's Thomas. You need to resolve this, Thomas. Now you need to resolve this. That's what God's saying to your heart today. Either you who are sitting in this congregation or you who are setting somewhere out there in the internet world. And so Thomas makes a great declaration. Jesus challenges it to be sure it's based on faith in the word of God. Faith in the word of God. In John, the 10th chapter, verses 22 through 39, a long passage, I take you to the Feast of Dedication. It's in the wintertime. The Feast of Dedication, it's in the wintertime. The scriptures will tell you that. And the Jews asked Jesus in John, the 10th chapter, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. He's been telling them plainly. He's been doing every unbelievable miracle that could be done. He has healed in the ninth chapter of John. He healed a child born blind, a child born without eyes. And he healed him so that he could see with eyes. Eyes. Like you and I have eyes. We can read. We can see. You suppose that was kind of plain evidence that he was doing the work of God? And that would prove the works that he did would prove that he was the Messiah who was to come and do these works. Isaiah 61. Do you, wouldn't you think that everybody who knew that grown man who was now a beggar on the streets, who had been born without eyes, who had met the man, the society took him in, and they checked him out every way he could be checked out medically. The family was interrogated to be sure that this was a miracle. And it was conclusive by every test society could give him that would prove Jesus wrong, proved him right. <laughs> Oh, how you doubt that God is able to take care of your situations and problems of life. Oh, how you doubt. Oh, ye of little faith. Doubt is based on lack of faith. Doubt is a lack of faith. 
Hello, Thomas. Hello, Thomas. He had all the credentials, didn't have the faith to back them up. Can you tell us plainly, are you the Christ? So we just go ahead and kill you. Well, how about chapter 9? Whole chapter devoted to this subject of this one man who everybody in the street that knew him knew this was a miracle. A man who had no eyes, had eyes now that could see. Listen, he was smarter without eyes than the people were that had him. If you read John 9. So Jesus answers this, will you show us? He answers the question or the demand. He says, I'll show you the Father's works. I keep telling you who I am. You don't believe me. So believe the works, just the, my works. If you can't see God in what I'm doing, because you don't believe what I'm saying, then let the works I do make me accountable whether I am from God or not. He's raising people from the dead. You know, uh, I mean, casting out demons was nothing compared to what he was really doing. He was healing the sick of all kinds of diseases. Unbelievable. A woman dying with the worst form of cancer with no possible cure for it. This blood disease. Boom. People, listen, people could get close enough to touch the hem of his garden, garment and was healed just by touching him. Nobody was doing that. And so he tells these people at the dedication service when you read it, listen, if you won't believe what I've been telling you, then listen, believe the works I do. The answer to your question and your statement to show you plainly I have shown you plainly. It's in, if it's not in my words and my life, then it's in my work. It's in the body of my work. You should believe. Well, as it usually went with the Jews, they picked up stones. That's how they responded to that message. They picked up stones. And so it was a life of Jews picking up stones Every time Jesus spoke, I have it really easy. I have it really easy. In John 31, he tells them, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Oh, he said, they said, it's not that. It's for blasphemy. Blasphemy. Listen, listen to this. And this is where religion is. Because you, being a man, make yourself to be God. They were right. They charged him wrong. He said, look at my body of work, and you'll know whether I am Christ or not. They said, we've seen your works. But we think you're blasphemous because you declare yourself to be equal with God. See, it was in John, the 10th chapter that he declared that God and him were one. John 10, 30. See, John 10 is one of my favorite passages. John, John 10, 28 through 30. <laughs> I mean, I cut my baby teeth on that. My baby teeth in Christ. <laughs> oh, yeah. In the upper room discourse, John 13 through 17, Upper room discourse. When he gets through with the upper room discourse, he goes to Gethsemane, then he goes to the cross. Going to go through trials, yeah, 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 and then the cross. In John 17, he closes, the, he closes out with prayer. The upper room discourse. In the 17th chapter, verse 11, he said to his disciples, I am no longer in the world.
Boy, it would be good for all of us to say that today. It would be good for all of us to say it. You know when you, you need to be no longer in the world? Before you die. <laughs> it's a given after you die. If I could get you to quit living in the world as the world, we could begin to really impact the world for Christ. Do you know that? I am no longer in the world. He said that before he went to the cross. I am no longer in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keeping them in your name, talking about his disciples and all those disciples that would come after. And the name, watch this now, and the name which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one. You know what the title to bring Jesus and God into one is the title Lord. It's not the name Jesus and it's not the name Christ. It's the name Lord. I'll call him name Jesus. He'll save his people from their sin. It's the idea of the cross. We'll call him Christ, the anointed one who was designated in the plan of God in eternity past to be the savior of the world. Lord, ah, what a title that is. Lord, he's the Lord. He is the Lord. Hypostatic union before the cross, hypostatic union after the cross, he is the Lord. The Lord. Listen, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, that they may be one. Listen, in Christ, in Christ, positionally, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. That Galatians 3.27. And into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.13. Boom, boom. When you are in Christ, you are in deity. I don't know what you think you're in, but you're in deity. No man can separate you from my hands. That's John 10, 28, 29, and 30, because the Father and I are one. When I enter faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I am baptized, church age. I am baptized into union with Christ. I am baptized into unity with deity. Who calls all the shots for my life. And that should be a wonderful way in my life. It ought to be my attitude. I want Christ to call all of my shots in my life. Did you know that? Guess what the Jews did after he told them that? They picked up stones. They picked up stones. If they'd have built something just during the life of Christ, they probably could have finished the temple. <laughs> they, they picked up enough, enough stones to build several houses, that's for sure. Humanity, you know. Here's point number two. Jesus Christ was born into the world, watch this now, as the only, this is a title now, the only begotten Son of God. The only begotten Son of God. I mean, nobody else with that title. Nobody in the human race with that title. Adam didn't have it. Because he wasn't born. Adam was born. <laughs> you didn't know that. Adam was born. Neither was Eve. Jesus Christ was born. Conceived. 
by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Luke 1, 34, 35. Matthew 1, 20. To be the only begotten born son of God. He's going to go through a nine-month pregnancy, and she's going to give birth to the only begotten son of God. Born out slave, outside the slave market of Adam's sin. Phew. Only begotten son of God title. And listen to how it's used. First John in John 1:14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. <laughs> the only begotten. Listen, he was born the same way you and I were born, by the word of God. Born by the word of God. Isaiah 7, 14, the virgin shall have the Messiah from the tribe of Judah, in the house of David. Luke 2. Do you know this history of your birth? Jesus, born of the word. Hmm. And the word became flesh and it dwelt among us. We saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the father. John 10, 18. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten who is in the, is that, look, hey, Don, look and see if that's not John 1, 18. I, mean, I don't think it's John 10. 118, that's, I think it's 118. Don will tell us in a moment. Always watch your numbers with me. Watch your numbers. It's 118. All right. Thank you, Don. Yeah, I thought it was 118. Don second that motion. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he's explained to him, the only begotten Son. Here's John 3, 16. We miss these kind of words, these title words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Again, John the 11th chapter 27 and 1 John 4, 9. Hopefully those verses, always check my verses. They're somewhere in the perimeter. <laughs> Listen to this one. To the shepherds in Luke 2, 11. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior. Watch how he's described. Who is Christ the Lord. In in Luke 1, 32 to 35, he tells Mary, the Virgin Mary, the same thing. In Matthew, not, in John, not John 2, but in Matthew 3, 17, at his baptism, when John the Baptist baptizes him, he's referred to as my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What are we talking about? We're talking about the Lord. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The doctrine, point three, the doctrine of one Lord was taught by Jesus to the priest nation of Israel who rejected it and him. In John 1, John 1, I, you know, I just, I just, we just did John 1, 14 and 18, right? Well, in John, John 1, 11 through 13, he came unto his own, his own received him not. But to as many as receive him, he becomes ch children of God. Then he goes down to 14, 18 and tells you who this guy is. This is who they rejected. You got to read the whole chapter to get it, preferably the book. 
I love this story. This story is missed by a lot. Would you go with me to Mark? Hey, let's, let's, let's take a break. Let's take a break. We'll come back to Mark. Let's take a break. This is a good place to break. I want, cause I want to get in that story. And I've, I've only got like 10 minutes. So I got five minutes. That's not enough for this story. This is a good story. This is a good story. So let's have a word of prayer. The men, the men, uh, the men will take the offering. And uh, we'll take a 15-minute break. And we'll come back and we'll finish the story on the one Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way. And even those every once in a while from the Internet who send an offering to us to keep everything floating their way, we're thankful for that. We're, we're really thankful for it. And especially, Father, for those out of Arkansas who uh, are faithfully listening to us and supporting our ministry. We're thankful for that. But, Father, giving is not by the law, it's by love. We're under the new covenant. It's not a matter of law, it's a matter of love. And love motivates us and gives us clues through the ministry of the Holy Spirit on how and how much and to whom and whatever. And some of it, Father, we just put in the plate and we trust our deacons and the leadership, the spiritual leadership of our church to spend it wisely. And I'm thankful for a great board of deacons that are really on top of that. So I pray today as the offering is sent around, Father, it's, it's not about priming the pump. It's about giving out of love, motivation, and grace that we might take the message to the far ends of the earth on the principle of grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And I, I want to look at Mark 12, if you would, with me. Mark, the 12th chapter. Kind of an interesting, for me at least was interesting, Mark 12, uh, 28 through 34. Very seldom do we find a scribe or a Pharisee confronting Christ that's positive. <laughs> these, these guys are hard to find in the scriptures. When you do find one, why, you go like, whoa, this is, and I found one, Mark the 12th chapter, 28, what, and, and, and it goes through 34. One of the scribes, they, the Pharisees, and they've been at war, of course, with Christ. One of the scribes came and he heard and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well. Ask him, what commandment is the foremost of all? In other words, he attended a Bible study with Jesus, and the Pharisees jumped all over him and started questioning him. That's the earlier part of the passage. And he thought Jesus Christ held his own in there and was really smart in the scriptures. And he was impressed with that. And, and so he asked him a question. He said, and I love the way he's introduced here to us. What commandment is the foremost of all? This wasn't the first time this question had been asked of Christ. And it wasn't the first time he answered it this way. But it's interesting because this time we have somebody really positive with what he's got to teach. Jesus answered, the foremost is here, O Israel. Now pay attention because this is my study. The Lord our God is one Lord. That's, that's, a, that's the famous Shema of Hebrew. That's the famous Hara. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That's a very famous uh, that's Deuteronomy 6, 4. That's very famous. And then he said the second is this. Now, he, he wanted to know what commandment is the foremost, so he gave it to him. But he said there's a close second. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's Leviticus 19, 18. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, 
at another time when this was asked, he said, on these hang all of the commandments. Remember that? The scribe, that's not during this time, though. The scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else beside him. And to love him with all of your heart and with all of your understanding and with all of your strength and to love one's neighbor as himself. See, that's if you love God that way and you love somebody else, then that's the love of God flowing from you. Is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, spiritually, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one ventured to ask him any more questions. Very seldom do we get a scribe or a Pharisee but every once in a while we do, and they're highlighted. For example, when we saw a Pharisee with positive volition, we named him. He was given a name. His name was Nicodemus. Remember that? The wonderful, the, oh, and what wonderful things came out of John 3, John the third chapter. Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee with positive volition. Here is a scribe with positive volition. Jesus didn't get to see a lot of it, did he? But listen, like all of us, he saw enough of it to, enough of it to encourage us about this. And you know, people say to me, Ron, does it, do bother, does it bother you to see your attendance dwindle? Of course it does. Of course it does. But you know what? I'll tell you what God is doing. He's building a pivot. I'm a pivot pastor. I always have been. I'm a pivot pastor. I know that. I've known it since the day I walked into the church ministry. I knew because I studied under a, a very excellent Bible teacher in Bob Thien. that taught me the concept of ministering to a pivot because when everything else falls apart, the pivot is what survives. I spoke about this the other day. I forget what group I was speaking to, either Tuesday night or Wednesday night, about Elijah. I think it was Wednesday night, wasn't it? Wednesday night, Elijah, the man of prayer where Elijah thought he was the only need that had bowed to Baal. And when God answered his prayer, you know, the, the three and a half years of drought and then brought it back, he told him that, you know, you whine about a whole lot of stuff you shouldn't whine about. <laughs> For example, he says, there are 7,000 knees that have not bowed to Baal in Israel who have been praying for the same prayer that you prayed. You're not the only one that prayed the prayer and I answered. You just happen to be the prophet of the nation. You get all the, you get all the six o'clock news, whether it's good or bad. But there are 7,000 knees that have not bowed to Baal that have prayed the same prayer that we have prayed here today, like-minded people of the word of God. When I went into ministry in 74 as a pastor, I had come from a pastor who was really, who really ground this in, made an impact on my life on this idea that you teach a group and out of the group you're looking for a pivot. When the numbers shrink, what you get is a pivot. 
Now, let me tell you, because we're a pivot today. Our ministries are outside of us. The great ministries are outside of us. They're not inside of us. And that's evidence of a pivot. The evidence of a pivot. The pivot, sometimes you can't see the pivot because there's so many people. The work is always done by the pivot. It's never done by the people. It's done by the pivot, always. Always. Sometimes you can't see the pivot because there's so many people. You said in a church with 2,000 people, the pivot's still the ones over there. Yeah, and everybody, all pastors know that a small run a large ministry, small amount run large ministries. Everybody knows that. We've, we've gotten down to the pivot, and that's a good thing because, listen, the pivot is what drives Christianity anyhow. It's never the masses. It wasn't true in Jesus' life either. We are a pivot. We're a, a group of solidly mature believers. And listen, I know this about you. You're having an enormous ministry. And every once in a while, I get, I get to sit down with some of you and have a cup of coffee. And you tell me about enormous ministries that God has given you in schools and businesses and neighborhoods. And it's a marvelous thing for me to hear. I love that. And you all are having your own, Horton calls it your six feet of influence, wherever you sit, six feet. You're having an enormous impact at, and the jobs, the places you work, even though you think, I don't think I'm having an impact. I can tell you are because of, your, of the evidence of Christ. You know, you're not putting, them, you're not putting it on for anybody. You're not, you know how sometimes you put it on for somebody? Listen, you people are wearing Christ in a proper way. It's, it's part of who you are. And when you are that way, your, in, your influence flows from your life. Your passion for Christ, even though, even though sometimes it looks really personal, and you go like, "Well, I don't, I don't try to." I know. Listen, a light's a light, no matter what the container is. I mean, you can have a great flashlight; looks really good and won't work, but it looks wonderful. I mean, you want a flashlight to have a light. I don't care how beat up it is and everything. I want it to, uh, the light is what's important. It's not the container, it's the light. And uh, so every once in a while, you have a moment like this where everybody's chonked out, every taking, everybody's taking a pound of flesh out of you. And in comes one guy and says, well, I have a question. And he thinks, oh, here we go. And the guy has a question. And you give him the answer, and the guy is all over. He's full of positive volition. He's into the word of God. And you go like, wow, you're not far from being where you ought to be. You know, if you go a half a mile, take a right and a left, you'll be there. That's how close you are. That's a wonderful thing. When you find somebody that's lost that's pretty close, that gets kind of exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I think maybe. So I, lo I love this about it. But here's the phrase I'm after. The phrase I'm after is Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel. That was famous in Israel. It was the Shema. The Shema was famous. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He, and, and he has a name today. In the New Covenant, they didn't know. They, it was God. It was Lord. But listen, in the New Covenant, listen to me. It's all boiled up into the Lord, God, is Jesus Christ. It's got a name. Got an address. Got a street number. You understand? Jesus of Nazareth was the only begotten Son of God. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You looking for that? That's second coming talk, isn't it? He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Today he's my Lord. He is deity. And when I get saved, I'm connected with deity. 
Because if I'm in Christ, I'm a deity. You understand that? I'm held by the hand of deity. It is the deity, it is the Lord Jesus Christ that runs the affairs of my life, and I'm glad for that. The only times it doesn't go good was when I try to run them. When I try to run them. Jesus said to the young man, you are not far. You're close. You're close. You're not far. We've all had meetings with these kind of people when they're just about there and they can't quite get it. You think to yourself, you may not say it, but you think to yourself, oh, you are so close. You need to keep coming back and let's talk, right? We need to have some more conversation. Now, if I know this young guy well enough, like the rest of us, he wanted more information, didn't he? Not far. Not far. I need to have a second. Can we have another meeting, you know, if I'm not far? Positive vision is not, not going to walk away from that deal. Not far. Not far. Here, here, here's another one. When Peter was at Caesarea in Acts, the 10th chapter, and he was dealing, God was getting him out of a Jewish frame of mind and into an international frame of mind of salvation. Out of only the Jews can be saved. Oh, I think Gentiles, the rest of the world, Jews and the rest of the world can be saved. God was making a transition out of the old covenant into the new covenant. A misunderstanding of the old covenant, by the way, into a new understanding of a new covenant. And when you read this passage of scripture, there's a part in there that I, I want to focus on. You can read the, the whole thing on your own. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Listen to this. He is Lord of all. That's capital L. He is Lord of all. Now watch number four. Because we take this idea of the Lord Jesus Christ is so commonplace. Listen. The Lord attached to the name Jesus Christ is a household word in Christianity today. Isn't that wonderful? That's a good thing. It's a household word. I mean, who even, who even thinks about a study like I'm just giving you to prove to you that Jesus is Lord? We're so fortunate in America. We are so fortunate in America. All you have to do is travel overseas a while. And we're so fortunate. Following Pentecost of 30 AD, the Feast of Pentecost in 30 AD, the title Lord as deity given to Jesus Christ became a household name. Keep a household name. Before you close the book of the New Testament up, the Lord Jesus Christ, the title Lord attached to Jesus Christ is a household word. I'm going to show it to you. At Pentecost, Peter, in Acts, the second chapter, 32 to 36, I put read for you, for your reading. I can't read that today. It, for it was not David who descended into heaven, raised from the dead, and descended into heaven. But he himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, God the Lord said to, said to my Lord, which would be Jesus Christ, said to Christ, Old Testament, set up my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. We know he's talking about Jesus Christ. Make a footstool for my feet. Operation footstool. That's second coming stuff. We know that. That's a given. Under New Covenant theology, that's an absolute. In eschatology, nobody disputes that. But they had to learn that. It was one of the messages at Pentecost to say that if Jesus is the Christ, and he is because he was raised from the dead, that he is the Lord's Lord. <laughs> so good. And, of course, that's a, that's a quote out of Psalms 110.1. Ananias, listen to this, Ananias to Paul. Ananias was the guy who was responsible to mentor Saul of Tarsus after his conversion on the road to Damascus. 
Ananias. Listen to how he addresses Paul. We're in 36 AD. We're in 33 AD at the conversion of Paul. Somewhere around that. Listen to how he addresses it. He says to him, he says to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus. How about that? Who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, who has changed your life. You know, you know how God, you know how the Lord changes your life dramatically? And it won't be dramatically unless that happens. You know how he changes it dramatically? Now listen to me. From the inside out, not from the outside in. And when he changes your life from the inside, he changes your directions, your attitudes, and all the things attached to it. And when he doesn't change you inside, you have all these other things attached to it. You have all kinds of iffy stuff. When I got saved, he changed me inside out and changed my whole directions of life, my whole attitudes about life. He changed me inside out. It's a change of your core. And it's a change that has continually processed my life for Christ. It was dramatical. It was for Paul. It is for everybody. Conversion is an inside work to the outside, not from the outside to the inside. You are born again. You are regenerated. You are forgiven. All these things are internal workings in your life. And when he doesn't change your core, then you behave and think like the average guy on the street. No difference between you guys. When he, when he saved my life, he, he worked from the inside. I changed, my whole life changed directionally. I don't know what you think gets saved. <laughs> the Bible says your soul. That's your core of who you are, your body, soul, and spirit. That's your core. That's your whole belief behavior system. And it says it gets born again. It happened to Paul. It happened to me. And it happened to you. And that process is going on from a baby way of thinking to an immature way of thinking to a mature way of thinking in regards to who the Lord is in your life. And at some point, he is your life. At some point, he is absolutely 100% your life. I wouldn't want it any other way. Peter at Lida, at Lista in Joppa over the Dorcas incident said, it became normal over all Joppa and many, watch this, and many believed in the Lord. It's a household word. And many believed in We use it that way, don't we? It became a household word. People aren't fighting over this stuff anymore. It's a house of words. It's a given. It's a theology. It's a standard, basic, foundational theology. At the church conference in 50 AD, it was put in decree, in a decree. We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. It's a household term. Household term. How about this one? This is quoted all the time. Here's the household term. Romans 14, 8, 8, 9. 14, 8, 9. If we live, we live for the Lord. Who's he talking about? 
we know, all know who he's talking about. We all know who he's talking about. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. What are, listen, now it's become a household word. And the Lord will be king over the earth in that day. Oh, that's the second coming. Finally, during the second advent, Jesus will be called the Lord of lords and the kings of kings. The king of kings. 1 Timothy 6, 15, Revelation 17, Revelation 19. Out of Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. We know who that is. In that day, will be the only one in his name, the only one. Who will that be? It will be the Lord Jesus Christ. We all believe that. That's the eschatology of the new covenant. And everybody knows. When you say the Lord, everybody knows who you're talking about today because he's become a household word. You know why? Because of the great teaching of the early church. Before that first century ever closed, it was a household word. Listen to Philippians 2, 9 and 10, and, or 11, and we'll close. For this reason also, God highly exalted him. I tell you, that's got to be a big deal when God highly does anything. Huh? When God highly exalts you, how, how big would that be? <laughs> When God, I, when God highly exalts you, how big could that be? For this reason, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who in heaven, earth, under the earth, and that every tongue will confess, watch this, that Jesus Christ is Lord. <laughs> Uh, if you think it's a household word now, it's a house word, household word forever. Huh? How fortunate you are to know all this. How fortunate we all are. One Lord. One Lord, and we know his name, Jesus Christ. 